Brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as what? A thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Amen. You are all the children of light and yes. the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. I'm going to kind of teach, preach, preach. But I'll, I've got a thought, and I want to use this. I've got my hands full. <laughs> I've got my hands full. Praise God. You can be seated. A question that comes up a whole lot uh, and, and casual talk anymore is, is what do you think, preacher? Do you think that the church is going to go through the tribulation? I'm going to answer that tonight if it's... <laughs> really that important to you, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that. But I will say this before I answer that. I've got my hands full just fulfilling or trying to be the First Thessalonians 5 person. I love First Thessalonians chapter 5 because Paul gives us a whole lot of instructions in this chapter. First of all, he's speaking to Christians in verse 4. He says, That you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Amen. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others. I like that. There's a whole lot right there. Yes. Therefore let us not sleep as other people do. That means uh, get you a more comfortable bed. Now, that's not what he's talking about. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us, what? Watch and be sober. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And then here in verse 8 is where I get my real job description. And it's a very tough job. But let us, who? Christians. People who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now I know y'all, as, as Christians, I know for a fact that we're not always sober. Uh, some people say, wow, y'all going to drink it? No, that's not what it's talking about. That's right. We are not always sober. We get intoxicated with a whole lot of stuff, don't we? Amen. Uh, we get involved with stuff that consumes our time and our body and our mind and our strength. So sometimes it takes something to wake us up or it takes something to get us sober. I, I, I love uh, one-line daily devotions. I, uh, you, know, you know, sometimes you just, uh, I always read my scripture on, the, on my iPad in the morning and it, it, it starts sometimes with just a little one-line thing. And, uh, 
even when I'm studying, I want to open it up to see if there's just a one-liner that I uh, that, that's going to make my day. And, and uh, a one-line Bible verse that just sometimes will sober us up to get us to think in godly things instead of uh, our minds on other things. I'm working on a sermon now, and I even mentioned it Sunday. It, Sunday it's, it's a one-liner that God gave me. When nothing makes sense, He's still God. Amen. Amen. Sometimes those things, just, just like that, just sober me up. And sometimes a question like, do you think the church is going through the great tribulation is enough just to get me sober or to wake me up? But really, church, we've got our, we've got our hands full just trying to stay sober, haven't we? Accidents happen because we're not sober. Come on. Um, how could I get in my truck, my pickup truck, and sitting at the house? I'm running into the house just for a few minutes, and, and I've got my mind on a whole lot of things, and I come back and jump in my truck and put it in reverse and forget that I have the trailer behind it. How is that possible? How could you? How, because we've got our minds on so many things. And I back it up. And, and when I hear the, the metal to metal crunching, banging sound, I'm awake. I'm awake now. I'm sober now. What in the world is that noise? It's the fender on my truck being smashed by the trailer behind me that I just jacked up because I forgot it was back there. Sometimes we, we need to be uh, awakened by, by something that stirs us. And, and, and this chapter really stirs me. Because, y'all, we've got our hands full. Right? Our mind is so occupied with other thoughts and other things. But, but we've got our hands full trying to think on the things that Paul says in Philippians 4 and 8. Think on things that are pure things that are lovely, things that are praiseworthy, but we're always getting our minds off of those things and on to our own agenda and our own things. We're not supposed to be sleeping as others, but let us watch. Let us watch. Amen. Listen, we can all get drunk with pride. We can all get drunk uh, uh, or have passion or, or get giddy with self-conceit or, or drunk with self-gratification. We can get so involved in the next big event in our life that we forget about the main event. Right, right. There's so much more important here. I, I like Paul. He says, we need to put on the breastplate of faith. Why? To protect the heart and the helmet to secure our head. We need not forget about the three great graves, uh, uh, graces of a Christian armor. Faith, love, and hope. But if we're not careful, we'll forget about those three things. If we live by faith, it will keep us watchful and sober. How many of you know that if you have faith in God, then you've got spiritual enemies? Yes. We are wrestling every day. Your hands are full. You don't have time to be watching. Huh? Can I say this? Your hands are so full, you don't have time to watch what I'm doing. Huh? Okay, I'm just, I'm just throwing that in. You don't have time to be telling me what I need to be doing. Come on now. You don't need to be concerned about what's wrong with me because our hands are full. Right? Our hands are full of taking care of our own stuff. Should be. And not in the things of others. Come on. Our war is not against flesh and blood, y'all. My war is not against you. I don't need to be looking at you and talking about you and, uh, and what you need to be doing. What I need to be doing is trying to take care of myself in this fifth chapter like Paul says. Take care of myself and looking at my own stuff here and wake up and be sober because that's a full-time job. 
Our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers of darkness. It's against principalities, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Ephesians 6 and 12 talks about that. Let us not sleep as others do. Let's not be like others. And I, I've got to measure your hair. I've got to measure your dress. I've got to measure your whiskers. Huh? Come on now, y'all. It's time to wake up and realize my hands are full just trying to take care of me. Making sure that my heart is protected and my mind is pure. And making sure that nothing shakes my hope of salvation. Listen, the only hope we have is grounded upon God. Amen. Look at verse 9. God hath not appointed us, the people of the day, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But to all of those who are living in darkness, those who are caught up in being involved in other things, those who are drunk with other important issues, are appointed to wrath. Listen, my hands are so full of watching me and trying to be sober myself, it's a full-time job. Listen, do you know if we watch and be sober, it is evident that we are appointed to obtain salvation. That'll give you hope, won't it? Amen. That, that'll sure give you hope when you realize that, hey, God is watching us and he's already destined us and he's already appointed for us to be, to have salvation. Um, you know, if we were able to obtain salvation by our own merit or our own power, we can have but little hope of it. But God has appointed it through Jesus Christ. That's what his word says. God's spirit drew us to him, didn't it? So he has appointed us. He wants us to be saved. Now he wants us to do good things and to think on good things. Yes. Now let me show you something here. The word wrath has two meanings. In verse 9 it says, God has not appointed us to wrath. That definitely means in this particular verse, that definitely means punishment or Anger. God has not chosen us so that we have to suffer and go through anger. But wrath, according to Strong's Concordance, also means reaching forth or excitement of the mind to long for, to covet after, to desire. So two things I want to say here. Number one, God did not appoint us or select us to be Christians who are always desiring or reaching forth for those things that would cause us not to be sober. Amen. Or for those things that would make us drunk. God never meant for us to reach for those things. Neither did he appoint us to find fault with others. I promise you that I'm not perfect myself. And if you follow me around, a while, you'll find out that I'm not perfect. You'll find out that something's wrong with me. I'm human. Yeah. Amen. I don't mean that. I, I'm, I'm looking for sin. You know, I'm trying to sin. But you'll find out there'll be something that you don't like about me. Last year at the fireworks tent, y'all, even when you try to do good, evil's ever present. That's true. Last year at the fireworks camp, we had this nice LED sign that uh, they had printed up for us, you know, and it's, it's a church fireworks. Wow, man, knock your eyes outside, you know, great, man, beautiful. And a man stopped by, and he said, your sign offends me. And I thought, okay, this is one of those guys that, you know, everything offends him. He said, no, I'm a, I'm a church-going man, and he said, the crosses in the background for your church fireworks don't need to go with church fireworks. Um, and I would like for you to change it. Well, um, I didn't go 
wanted no cussing rage or nothing. But I said, I appreciate your concern about our sign. And I'm glad you noticed our sign. But I have no control over that sign. The man that programmed it, it's fixed. That's the way it is. And I'm sorry. And you'll have to live with it. If you drive by here and you see the cross in the background, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, well, you're, you're just making the cross of, of, of none effect, you know. Um, see, y'all, here's the thing about it. You follow me around sometimes, and, and my attitude might not be what you would think because it, it, I, didn't, I didn't act upset, but it upset me. It upset me. You, see, I've got my hands full just trying to take care of me. But I want, I want to go to another place. However, here, if wrath also means reaching forth or stretching or desiring, Paul gives us a whole list of things that we should be reaching forth and the things that we should covet. Verse 11, he says, Comfort yourselves. What? Together. Together. Wow. Y'all, I'm telling you what, our hands are full. There's so much for us to do. Then he says, Edify one another. Don't tear one another down. Lift up one another. Pick up one another. Verse 12, know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Verse 13, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Well, that's a full-time job right there. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14, when those that are unruly, or warn those that are unruly and comfort, what? The feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but, unto, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Verse 16. Here it is. Here's a full-time job. Rejoice evermore. Yes. Uh, here's another full-time job. Verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. Verse 20, despise not prophesy. Number 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Number 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Wow, we've got a whole lot to do. There's a whole lot in there for us to do. So I don't need to worry about you or what you're going through or what, you know, if you're going through something, I need to help you pray about it. I need to encourage you. I need to lift you up. I, I need to do that. That's, that's part of my job. That, I've got my hands full. How many of y'all ever ask somebody to do something and they'll say, well, wait just a minute. I've got my hands full right now, but just as soon as I can set this down. You know, a lot of times we need to just set some things down that are really not that important and pick up this chapter 5 and say this is where my mind needs to be this is where my heart needs to be this is what I need to be doing right here it's the most important thing well I thought we were going to talk about whether or not the church was going through the great tribulation <laughs> my hands are full <laughs> my hands are full man that, you know we, we got so much to talk about right here in this chapter. I've got my hands full just, just trying to obey this and do what it says here. I ain't going to talk about it. I did cover some of it already. Uh, verse 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath if we're children of the day. Amen. Come on. Romans 5 9 tells us we should be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 1 10 tells us again that Jesus will deliver us from the what? Wrath to come. Here's the question. Did Jesus tell us to look for the great tribulation or did Jesus tell us to watch for him? No. Huh? If his church is to go through the great tribulation, then I've got a problem with Luke 21, 36. Because it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be able to escape. 
escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus was speaking of the great tribulation. Amen. Listen, if Jesus is coming for his church, then the church should be looking for him, yes. not looking for the tribulation. Amen. But if we're going through the tribulation, then I guess we need to be looking for the tribulation. Y'all, 310 times his coming is mentioned in the Bible. Yes. 310 times. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 again says, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. Y'all, if we are the saints of God, everybody say, we are. We are. Jesus is coming to the thief, or he's coming as a thief in the night, but not to the saints. That's right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says, That day should not overtake you as a thief. Listen, as saints, we are aware of the signs of the time, aren't we? Yes. We can look around and we can see all of these things that are going on in our day. And most of the world can't even uh, determine that there are any signs. That's right. Because they don't know what the signs are. But we as Christians, we know what the signs are. It, he says it's going to be like the days of Noah. Uh, there'll be days, there'll be times that like at, at the end will be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and signs in the heavens and uh, moons turned to blood and all of that. Just a few things about a thief here. I'm, I'm almost done. I just like four more pages. I'm going to quit before then. A few things about a thief. A thief will not come openly. He comes in secret. And he comes for a purpose. And the crazy thing is, a thief don't take everything in the house. Does he? That's true. He just gets the precious things. The jewels. The gold. Whoop, glory. <laughs> the fine ornaments. Bracelets and necklaces and watches and money and credit cards. As soon as he gets what he's gone or what he's what he's after, he's gone. And he always leaves more than he takes. I'm preaching now. Mm, yes. Wow. Mm. So it is with Jesus when he comes, y'all. He will take only the precious chosen ones and he will leave more than he takes. That's true. He's only going to take what he comes after. Nothing else. All through the Bible, God would not destroy his people. The flood did not kill everybody. That's true. Amen. In fact, with Sodom and Gomorrah, God did not destroy the city until the righteous got out. Right. Amen. What about the great exodus of Israel out of Egypt? Three million people gets up in the middle of the night and they left without saying goodbye. They left more than they took. And everybody they took was not alive. Man, I didn't know my sermon I was going to preach. <laughs> Joseph said, don't you leave here without taking my bones. It don't make sense. God, I'm not even getting on that. It don't make sense. Why are you going to take my bones out there? The dead had to rise first, y'all. Come on. Before they could all leave, that's Bible, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and they will be caught up together with him in the air. Amen. The Egyptians represented those who were not ready. The tribulation period is God's declaration of war on wickedness, not on His righteous people. Amen. The scripture is often used in Matthew 24, 29 through 30 to prove that the church is going through the tribulation. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn 
And then shall and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I believe this is talking about the twelve tribes of Israel, the hundred and forty-four thousand elect Jews. But watch verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from where? From one end of heaven to the other. How did he get them out of heaven if they hadn't gone up in the rapture before? <laughs> yep. huh? How can he gather them if the elect is not in heaven already? Listen, here's the deal. Everybody has questions about the end time. Everybody's got questions about the Bible. Everybody's got questions about certain situations that's going on. And we need to answer those questions as best we can. But it's not time. We don't have time. Our hands are full of just taking care of ourselves and making ourselves ready to go to heaven instead of wasting our time on all of those petty issues. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you, but I got my hands full. I got my hands full. Let's stand. Here's a question for you tonight. If he was to come tonight, are you ready? Because the whole chapter, the whole fifth chapter is about getting ready to meet the Lord. Amen. That's the most important thing. And all of this that I've read is about us getting ourselves ready to meet God. And it's about getting us ready so that the world can look at us and want to copy us and want what we got. What have we got? We're supposed to have Christ within us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Question is, are you ready to meet him if this is the night he comes? If this is the time that he set aside to come tonight, are you ready? Can you say, I've got my hands full working on me? Yeah, I know there's a song that says he's still working on me, and I'm glad he is. But every morning when I get up and I start praying, I find out there's a whole lot I need to get ready. There's a whole lot in my life that I need God to take control over.
And I pray right now for the quickening power of the Holy Ghost just to touch them, Lord, and, and touch their lives, Lord, in a special way right now, Lord, and convict them with the power of the Holy Ghost right now, Lord. And God, give them the willpower, give them the Spirit of God to change right now, to change their life, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus right now. praise you for it. We thank you for it, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord bless you. We appreciate you. Thank you for being here in this service tonight. Come back Sunday. Bring somebody with you. Let's have a great time here at 11 o'clock. We're looking for God to do something great. Amen. God bless you.